What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. Today, I'm joined with Sebastian, and is it uh, Zaba? Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yep. Excellent. Phonics for the win. And how are you doing today, Sebastian? Excellent. How about yourself? I'm fantastic, especially because I don't know if you know this, but today we are joined by my very favorite member of the audience. And why is my favorite audience member here? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate players, syndicators, sometimes contractors, operators, sponsors, all that kind of stuff. And you might ask, why would you do that? And the answer is, if you've ever been involved in an off-market deal, sometimes called private deals, sometimes called 506B syndications, you should know that you need a documented prior substantive relationship or else the SEC will get ants in its pants and we definitely don't want that. It turns everything into a house of cards. But uh, the exciting thing for you is you're gonna learn how to effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate deals and understand how my guest fits in. But before we get too excited about business, Sebastian, do you wanna say a thing or two about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, my background is actually a software engineering, um, software engineering manager, um, you know, started doing real estate. Last year, actually, uh, my friend pulled me in. Um, he has a portfolio of 480 uh, doors at this point. Um, he pulled me in January. Now we're probably purchasing 10 to 20 units every other month at this point. It's going to brought me in to kind of scale things. So we used to scale software for self-driving cars and you know mapping and all that stuff. Now we're scaling real estate with them. So it kind of brought me on board because of a good synergy. And I've been learning and growing my own portfolio and our combined portfolio since then. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. And uh, the first segment that we do in these chance encounters is the motivation. Before that, though, I got to say, but wait, check your eight. Uh, Sebastian, you mentioned uh, your, your tech background. I don't know if you can see through the camera and into the user's device, but down there somewhere, there, there might be this hideous subscribe button that maybe they should, you know, okay, it's a stupid joke. Anyways, the motivations, I've now spoken to hundreds and hundreds, I may have crossed over a thousand already, different investors, syndicators and whatnot, and everybody has their own unique reason why they are in this industry, but I found they fit pretty neatly into these five different categories. And it's important to know what that motivation is just because what's going to stop somebody from quitting and the first one of them is the preservation of purchasing power what's that well some people they don't have a full-time job as a matter of fact the way they pay their bills is from the proceeds of ownership and if you're in that kind of situation why on earth would you want to make another acquisition after all it takes months to close it takes years to go full cycle and with these guys the answer there there are a few of them one is if inflation is rearing its ugly head, that's going to eat away from the purchasing power of your cash flow, so it's going to be time to make another acquisition. The other one is when there's distress or an asset crash and you can get a steep discount, that is when they're going to pull the trigger. I'm not that far in my real estate journey yet. More specifically for me, because of my background in tech, I worked in the CRM industry and I opened a CRM agency. That's how I got into real estate. But when I started working with a guy who was flipping 10 houses a month, more specifically doing 10 transactions uh, per month uh, for years before he hired me, I started to realize that my tax burden was ridiculous. And I was like, how can I pivot where I'm getting rewarded for my effort in the form of deployed capital, AKA equity. So that's why I'm in the game personally. That's a little bit abstract for a lot of youngsters. What they're looking to do is something like hustle like crazy right now and fast track the retirement. But 
other people, it's more about taking over your schedule. So you can work fewer months per year or uh, fewer uh, weeks per month, different things like that. And uh, a lot of people who have this as their motivation think that's secretly what everybody's up, up all about, but that's simply not true. Some people are fueled by ambition. They want to buy their entire hometown. They want that generational wealth. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. And that's why they're constantly making these acquisitions, which makes them fantastic parts of any commercial syndication because they're going to be hustling into their 90s. Just like the last group where they not so much about their own personal ambition, they've picked a sector of society or maybe it's animals, maybe it's the environment. But regardless, if you want to have a big impact on society, you need to have a financial backing for that. And that's why some people are making their acquisitions. So Sebastian, of those five different motivations, what combination of those would you say describes you best? My motivation is actually the last one here. <clears throat> um, you know, being in tech with pretty decent salaries, you know, retirements, 401ks, all those things set up. So um, it's my motivation to help actually my friends and family um, to retire. Um, Selfish reasons, I want to hang out more with my friends and I never have time or money. So I'm kind of trying to get them pulled in. Hey, some passive income, you know, help you retire, do this, you know, for 10, 15 years with me, and then you can retire and we can spend more time together. Um, that was initially, um, but since we're scaling so much, we really want to help improve neighborhoods. So we tend to buying, you know, the entire blocks usually at a time, um, you know, one at a time and then kind of acquire it and improve the whole, you know, neighborhood. Uh, it's good for business, right? Because you're raising, you know, one asset and then you get a good account for your next place that you're buying next door to it. Um, but it also helps the communities, you know, to transition from like, you know, um, C style neighborhoods, you know, um, to like a B or something. So we kind of buy in those areas and try to bring that up and help those communities. I love that answer. Love that answer. But of course, it's one of the wonderful things about real estate. It's there are all these different opportunities, but you can't ignore the fact that there are risks involved. And if you've ever been involved in a 506B deal, whoever the securities attorney uh, what was that was involved in the process, they should have insisted that everybody fills out this super invasive financial questionnaire questions that uh, most people aren't very comfortable answering. But there was one question I found in that list, I thought it wasn't effective at giving real actionable answers, and it was the tolerance for risk assessment question. So I made my own one, which is a fill in the blanks question. There are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. What's too risky for you, Sebastian? Right now, commercial, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like anything storefronts, anything, you know, office buildings, these type of things with this current market. Um, we're seeing a lot of, you know, office buildings be converted to apartments or condos. Um, the banks finance a lower ratio when you buy multifamilies, if there's any have a storefront commercial attached to it. So I'm going to go with their ratings and kind of, you know, try to avoid any type of commercial um, attachments to our multifamilies that we're purchasing. Gotcha, gotcha, I love it, I love it. Which brings me to the next question, which is the favorite deal metrics. This one I was a little bit uh, reluctant to add to the chance encounters when I first created the format, because some people are more public relations or marketing or something like that, and the person who's really gonna be doing the underwriting, the spreadsheet junkie, if you will, uh, they're going to be more concerned about these different numbers. But even if you are the PR person, there's gonna be some metrics that are basically your first actionable ones and the underwriters are going to say like what are you talking about all of these are important but uh, just for the people who are watch are just listening and not watching the actual video i'm going to read these out and then hopefully uh, sebastian you can give me your top three they are cash on cash IRR, cost per door, net operating income, also known as NOI, the going in cap rate, which really means the difference between the standard cap rate in that region versus what you're actually going to be paying for. Then there's the loan interest rate has become really, really important these days, especially if you're assuming it. Then the occupancy, which is also the vacancy rate. Then there's average income where the property is located, the amortization period of the loan, if you're assuming it especially. Then the 
difference between the market versus the in-place rent. And then we've got population growth where the property is located. We've got the sponsor record, which means how many deals have gone full cycle, how many are active right now. Then there's the waterfall split and exit strategy. In other words, what happens after your capital is returned to you. And then I also have DSCR, which is debt service coverage ratio. In other words, how much of the income from rents and amenities is going straight to the loan before it uh, has the opportunity to go to investors and GPs. So Sebastian, on that list, uh, what's your top three? Which ones uh, really stand out for you? I'm definitely cash on cash. Um, then your, you know, your waterfall split exit strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, um, I guess the sponsor record, because for us, mainly we're focused on providing cash flow for our investors, right? They want that check in the mail, help them, you know, supplement their income while their, you know, equity is growing um, within a property. So, and our system doesn't rely too much on what the rates are doing or we know our neighborhood pretty well, you know, so we're not relying on a lot of those factors. So for me, it's, you know, how much cash flow can I generate? from the beginning so I can start returning, you know, to investors that have to, you know, steady income to build our track record, right? Mm -hmm. I love that answer. I'm eating it up like a delicious subscribe <laughs> sandwich. Isn't that subtle? It's very subtle, isn't it? But I always pull that out because it reminds me it's time for the Dan Does Deals Commercial Core Competency Cube. And it's got the six different main roles in a commercial real estate deal. And the idea being that you will be able to more effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate deals because you know the different roles in them. And if you're looking at this and going, wow, I really need one of those, you can go to dandoesdeals.com. There's a great big button where you can download it and print it out. And like a complete dummy, I don't even ask for your email address which is the cardinal sin of marketing. You never, ever, ever, ever give away a freebie without some sort of contact information. But the important thing for me is that you get very confident when you're talking about this because I really think that is going to make or break your future in commercial real estate. It's that effective communication. And in every episode of Dan Does Deals Chance Encounters, I go through all six just to make sure that you understand how my guest fits into these deals. So first, we'll talk about repositioners. Repositioners are acquisition people so they have to look at a whole whack of properties and they have to do a whole bunch of paperwork what's that paperwork well they're underwriting the deal they're figuring out the math they're figuring out is this property even making the amount of money that the seller slash broker is claiming it is because eh. and one thing that's a little bit unconventional or unintuitive I suppose about being a repositioner is we all have to have a vast network of financiers which are people who only deal with paper and money they're lending they're not on the GP team and the reason why repositioners have to know a whole whack of financiers is because if the repositioner can secure a more advantageous loan that goes straight to the profitability of the building in other words that's the upside that's really what the repositioners job is is finding that upside finding ways to make that property make more money but of course after they've considered the financiers, the next place they're going to look is the operations team. And the operations team is, there's much more to it than just collecting rent and mowing lawns and shoveling snow if you're where I am. And me personally, when you're talking about repositioners, you have to have some sort of asset management role to be on the GP team. And me personally, between the automation from the CRM tech side, that's part of it and being able to build the web assets. But if you understand that the real key to this industry is you have to kill the vacancy, then somebody on the GP team is going to need some serious marketing chops. And that's one thing that I've provided some of these teams here uh, to, to basically pull my part. But there's only so much you can do with operations. So the next place a repositioner commonly looks is the contractor team to do a value add. They renovate the units, they make the property nicer. The idea being that the next residence would be more than happy to pay more in rent than the previous ones because it's a nicer place. But of course, if only it were that simple, you can spend endless amounts of money on contracting. You can go ahead and gold plate the toilets, but you're not going to get a return on your investment. So you have to have somebody who's going to keep an eye on these contractors, make sure they're not dragging their heels and going past the, uh, the scheduled amount of time, and also that they're not using subpar materials. So if you're like me, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm from the internet. That means I need locals. I need boots on the ground, somebody who can be there in an hour or two, because categorically that is not going to be me. I'd still be stuck at an airport in an hour or two, so I need somebody who lives nearby. But 
when the re repositioner has assembled this team, let's say you're the repositioner, you know, uh, or Sebastian, you know, you're, uh, you mentioned your tech background. So one thing that happens with people in tech and attorneys and physicians and engineers is they get the idea, hey, there's a great big 350 unit apartment complex down the road there. And if we all put down, you know, 100K or something like that, we could probably take it over. And then we just go to the bank and we say, hey, I got this 350 unit apartment complex I want to buy. It's just tens of millions of dollars. You don't happen to have, say, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars you want to lend us? Well, there's a problem with what I've said so far. And if you're in a mentorship program or with a guru, I recommend you listen very carefully to this next part because they tend to gloss over it. The financiers are going to ask you, who's the sponsor? Who's the key principal? So among the GP team, what's all that? Well, the answer is if somebody, if you don't have anybody in the fold who already owns a similar asset, you will not be eligible for the commercial loan. And of course, with 506B rules, it's a big problem because you wouldn't be able to meet new sponsors and get them involved. So you're kind of at a disadvantage if you don't know more sponsors. But on top of that, on top of that similar asset, among the GP team, you need a certain amount of liquidity and you need a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Sebastian, I know that uh, everybody is doing some sort of repositioning, asset management through operations and whatnot, but uh, uh, what are the pieces of the puzzle that you expect to contribute in your next deal? Um, we do a lot of it, right? We have our own operator team that my partner runs, our own construction teams with the contractors or a property management company that kind of manages our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mainly, you know, doing investor relations, um, you know, finding the, the funds to, to um, acquire these things and then you know using you know, partner to sponsors because we do have that portfolio build up so it's you know pretty straightforward to for us to finance these things mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff is in-house so we got the whole your whole um uh, ruby over there <laughs> yeah, yeah, vert vertical, vertical integration because you got to move it around a little bit you know right so Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's still a great answer. So let's move on to the buy box then. And when real estate people are saying, hey, what you're looking for? What's your buy box? What's an ideal property? We're asking for three main things. First one's geography. Where is it? Which state? Which county? Possibly even which neighborhood? It's absolutely going to matter. The second one's going to be size. Now, Sebastian already mentioned uh, that he's not huge on a lot of the commercial real estate sides of, uh, of, of this industry, especially like office buildings or whatnot. But most of my guests tend to be on in multifamily. And the way that you define size in multifamily is by the number of apartment units. Now, of course, there's other types of real estate that go off of square footage and whatnot. But that size is absolutely going to matter because the type of team that takes over 10 unit apartment complexes, they're going to look fundamentally different from ones that take over 350 unit apartment complexes. So the size definitely matters. Now, the third one is usually called class. I prefer to use the term desirability because it's really split into two completely separate parts. The first one's condition, the second one's area. And when you're talking about condition, we're talking about how old is the facility, how beat up is the building and the property in general, and then what sort of luxuries and amenities do they have? Is it no frills or is it uh, is it a really nice place to stay? So that's the condition. Whereas the area, because if you're, if you're talking about multifamily, then the school districts where the property is located is definitely going to matter. But regardless of what type of real estate it is, the crime rate is going to be very important. And then of course, there's that old trope of saying location, location, location. What they really mean in my view is they mean traffic, traffic, traffic. If more people are passing by a property every single day, it's automatically going to be more desirable. Now, both the, the area and the condition are ranked the same way as in grade school, where at the top you've got A+, plus, then you got A, then A-, minus, then B+, plus, and so on. So, Sebastian, as far as you and your organization, what's easier to say yes to? Uh, we focus on C-class. C-class, okay. And then uh, which, uh, which states? Uh, we do South Chicago. Illinois, South Chicago and area. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so uh, and then uh, as far as size, though, uh, it's it's smaller properties, right? Yes. So we say different model, which I like. We usually try to buy the whole block, right? So we start with whatever's on a block. It could be anywhere between ten and forty units, and we kind of acquire a place next to it to kind of hopefully go down a whole block till we own, um, you know, part of the neighborhood, the neighborhood, or the the few blocks that are have apartments there. 
All right. I love it. I love it. So then let's talk about people. My favorite part about commercial real estate is that because it's multifaceted, you got these different roles. People are really eager to make introductions, build new teams, even if they're not in them. But even though we're so eager to help each other, we all have our own unique skill sets. So we're better off helping some more than others. Uh, these days, I've done a little bit of a ship. Uh, shift. Uh, I've always said that the sponsors and KPs are the people who I'm most eager to talk to. That's still very true. It used to be because of my marketing and tech background. And these guys have a, a foundation already in place where a person like me can make a disproportionately large difference. But these days, uh, I'm uh, because of my association with check writers uh, and uh, debt funds, the sponsors are absolutely a key part of my business. And then, of course, different locals and repositioners are very important to me. But uh, Sebastian, uh, if you have any 506B deals, don't go mentioning them specifically, especially if you're going to say that you're looking for financiers. But uh, uh, on the die, like what roles, uh, who are you really eager to speak to? Generally sponsors, mm -hmm. right? Talk with sponsors, outreach, learning from them. Even though we have a good amount of units, we're trying to scale at this point. Um, sponsors seem to be the key principles, as you mentioned in there. I like your uh, verbiage there. Excellent. Excellent. And then let's talk about how to reach out. Me, I'm fortunate to have a super duper distinct last name. So it makes me really easy to find on LinkedIn, which is where I spend most of my social media time. But if you scan this QR code right there, that goes to the FAQs page of 506BME, which is the platform where I offer what's essentially a CRM service minus the broadcasting. I, it helps you document your substantive relationships before you get your deals going. And then that way, when the SEC audits you, you have that in hand. And even if your laptop falls in the bathtub, you're not going to lose that documentation of your substantive relationships. And you definitely need to have that if you do any 506B deals. But Sebastian, if people want to reach out to you, well, I know we met uh, at, uh, at Ray's Fest in Phoenix, uh, but uh, uh, what, what are the best ways to reach out to you? Yeah, we have our website, stennethcapital.com. Um, you know, we have our information on there, calculators, information, use cases, our strategies, everything's posted there. There's a good amount of educational content on there too. So yeah, stenneth, S-T-E-N-N-E-T-H, capital.com. And then my phone number, email, everything's on there. All right, beautiful. And that brings up me to the last part, which is a public service announcement. It's not for you, Sebastian. It's for you in the audience. If you've been watching this episode and you've been experiencing searing pains in your eyeballs, maybe like migraine-like symptoms, I'm confident it's because of the downright hideous subscribe button that's down there. And it's like, okay, and you can click on it and get rid of it for free. Full disclosure, I'm biased. I want people to click on it because if enough people do, then YouTube will start to pay for these videos instead of me. And I think that would be wonderful. The trade-off for you, just so we're clear, my videos may show up on your list of suggestions, but you can go ahead and ignore those suggestions because quite frankly, I'm just really appreciative that you spent this time with me. Just like Sebastian, I'm glad you joined me. This has been great. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Awesome, thanks. Hey there, are you interested in commercial real estate deals? Would you like to build your network of investors and deal sponsors? Well, the best thing I can do for you is have you appear on a chance encounter interview as featured on dandoesdeals.com. You may know me from 506BME or as a top commercial real estate voice on LinkedIn. And if I had to think of the top factors in your success in commercial real estate, my top two would be your network and your ability to effectively explain how deals work with effective communication. The 15 minute chance encounter format it checks both of those boxes and they ensure that you can share your private deals with me without the SEC calling it a public solicitation. So hop onto LinkedIn. You can see my name is over here, Dan Freidenberg, and search for my name. And the, the best way to reach me and book that is to message me through LinkedIn. And don't worry, it doesn't matter if you decided to enter this space just last week or two weeks ago, or if it was decades ago. It'll be fun and easy to look good. We're just asking multiple choice questions based on your core competencies you look to contribute, your level of sophistication, and all that kind of stuff. So I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey, yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner.
Okay, yeah, oh yeah, just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool, and now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay, are you already logged into 506 BB? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool, yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list, so when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me, everybody.